Hello, hello, and welcome back to The Natural Medic Adventures. My name is Craig, also known as The Natural Medic. Thanks for joining me in my third episode of my podcast. And I'm recording this on July the 1st, 2021, right before the 4th of July holiday weekend. So here in Texas and throughout the majority of the rest of the southern United States, that means the heat is coming. It's been a few days in the 90s, mid-90s, upper 90s, but mostly it's not been too bad so far this summer, but usually around the 4th of July time period through about Labor Day, sometimes even as far as um, October, sometimes even Halloween, (laughs) it's hot. But um, you can always work on your skills. You can be in the cool whenever you you know are working on those. You don't have to be out in the heat, or if you can, you can be close to home so you can cool off very easily. But we kind of talked about a lot of things last episode, and it kind of got a little lengthy. I'm trying to find my ideal length for my podcast, so bear with me as I kind of. Uh, tweak that a little bit. Um, I'm going to try to shoot for 25 to 30 minutes each episode and not get so so lengthy about stuff. So anyway, we're going to do a deep dive into what we talked about last week a little bit, which was the 10 essentials. Depending on time, we may not cover all the 10 essentials in in more in depth. We may have to push that into another episode. Just going to see how that time works. But the first thing we're going to do is talk about the Leave No Trace 7 principles. If you haven't heard of those, we're going to deep dive into those in just a moment. So thanks for joining me. And let's dive in to... The Natural Medic Adventures, Skills Edition, number one. Thanks for joining me. Okie doke. We are back. We are going to jump into the Leave No Trace 7 Principles. Let's go through a summary of them first, and then for sake of time, if we do have time, we will... Do a little deeper dive into those. Now, basically, these principles came about from research that was done by the National Park Service, the U.S. DA Forest Service, and the Bureau of Land Management. Those three agencies, two of them are the Department of the Interior. Of course, the Forest Service is in the U.S. Department of Agriculture. But they have the majority of the federal lands that are used for for recreation throughout the United States. There are other agencies to be sure, but those are the main ones. So they did a lot of research in the mid eighties and they looked at how the land was being used. They looked at how humans were using the natural resources on the park lands, on the national forests, on the BLM lands, and to see how the impact of human use and human overuse in a lot of places could be minimalized, how it could be put into a better perspective for long-term use of the lands so that they would not be worn down and there wouldn't be anything left whenever, you know, they were handed off to children and their children's children and things like that. So basically the seven principles are pretty simple overall. So the first one, and this is a summary, by the way, is plan ahead and prepare. We've talked about this in the previous episode. We talked about you know, using all trails or onyx backcountry or gut hook or something like that to 
help you to plan out, you know, what trail you're going to go to, what regulations are there, what kind of terrain so you can prepare, what kind of hazards, emergencies, you know, to expect, things like that. And also you would, you know, you would want to know, you know, what time would be the best time to use it. Some of these areas are very well loved, and so the, the use time is, you know, just incredible. There's just there's just people, people, people. A lot of the national parks throughout the the nation here in the United States, they are you know heavily utilized in the summertime. That's when a lot of people are out of you know uh, they're not working or they take summer vacation with their family and they go and you know go to the parks. In you know, in droves, you know, the big parks like Yellowstone, Yosemite, Grand Canyon, uh, Rocky Mountain National Park, just to name a few, you know, they get heavily utilized. You know, they get millions of visitors um, every every season, every year, and a lot of that comes during you know the warmer months of the year. So you want to. Try to schedule your trips the best way. You don't want to go in a large group if that's all if that's at all possible. You want to try and use a small group, and you want to, you know, make the best use of your own resources, such as such as food. You don't want to go out there with a bunch of food in you know regular packaging that you would you know that you would have at home. You want to try to, if you can, try to repackage that food so you don't have a whole lot of waste. Because ideally, it's always the best practice to pack out all of your waste. Not everybody does that. You always go to different places and you might see trash. And, you know, if, you, if you're able to get that safely and take it out, somebody else's trash, you know, you're doing, you're doing the land a, a favor by doing that. Um, the other thing is, you know, you, you, you want to, you want to carry, you want to carry, um, out all the stuff that you bring in and, you know, you don't want to take anything away. So you're trying to, um, minimize the trash that you're producing when you're out there in the, in the, these different natural areas. And you also don't want to impact the land negatively as far as, you know, trying to navigate around. You don't, you know, you don't want to use marking paint. You don't want to, rock cairns are nice. They're nostalgic in certain places, but generally speaking, they're not, they're trying not to disturb the landscape. So don't make rock cairns. Don't use flagging. Don't use marking tape. You know, be well versed in the use of a map and compass or your GPS unit or a combination of those to travel the best that you can. Um, when you're out there traveling, you want to stay on durable surfaces. So that means staying on the trail, staying in designated campsites, not making a new campsite. And you want to be on a hard surface area. So that's, you know, rock, gravel, sand, dry grasses, snow, you know, something, something like that. You don't necessarily want to be creating new areas that are not approved. Okay. And so I want to bear that in mind. We're on the second principle, by the way, which is travel and camp on durable surfaces. And just in case I didn't say plan ahead and prepare was the first one. Um, so in popular areas, you know, you know, if, you, if you're camping in a actual campsite, or a campground that actually has designated spots, you know, camp on the places that are designated for your use, you know, a tent pad or other hard surface, a shelter, so on and so forth. If you're on the, you know, if you're on the Appalachian Trail or some other trail like that that has shelters, you know, camp in the shelter or, you know, as allowed camp around the shelter, you know, just so that that, that concentrated use is, you know, in the, on a hard surface, so the impact is minimal. And when the trail is wet and muddy, you want to try to use good sense and walk 
in the middle of the trail so you're not wearing that trail down. And try to keep your campsite small. Don't don't focus about in areas, you know, that are off that, you know, well worn path, so to speak. You know, don't just set your tent down or your you know in a bunch of vegetation. You want to try to protect that area. And it's just the opposite when you're in a pristine area. So if you're in a wilderness area where there isn't designated camping necessarily, or the use is way, way down, you want to try to disperse the use in that case. And when you see places that are impacted, you want to try to avoid those so you don't create further problems. And of course, you don't want to camp near any kind of riparian area. So any lake, any lake, stream, creek, any place that water flows or water stands, you want to be at least 200 feet away from that. Now your waste, we talked about this already a little bit, disposing of your waste properly, packing it in, packing it out. So anything that you bring in with you, food waste, any kind of trash you produce, any kind of food litter, you want to get that out of there and take it out with you. When there's a toilet available, use the toilet. Otherwise, you need to follow the regulations for making a cat hole. And a cat hole is just simply a six to eight inch deep hole dug in the in the ground that you deposit your waste in. You I mean just to be simple, you poop in it. It's a hole you poop in. No easy way to say that. And you want to dig those cat holes, same deal. You don't want that right in the middle of camp. You want to be 200 feet away from any kind of area that would be normally traveled by other other humans. So that is, um, you know, 200 feet from any trail, any water, or any camping, you know, designated camping area. Okay. And when you get finished, you want to cover the, ha- the cat hole up. So you're usually going to carry a little trowel with you to dig the hole. And you cover you just use it to make the hole. You put your waste in the hole once you've once you once you're done. And you cover it up and you disguise it the best that you can so that it, over time that waste will biodegrade. Any kind of toilet paper, hygiene products, you generally want to pack those out in a in a plastic bag so that those don't uh, cause any kind of unsightly damage to the area as well. And the same thing for whenever you are washing dishes. You don't want to wash your dishes, you know, directly in a lake or a stream. You want to use very just the minimum amount of soap and the minimum amount of you know of water that it takes to to clean and wash your, your dishes. It doesn't take that a lot of that soap that you can get, like camp soap for example, is very highly concentrated and you don't need a lot to get your uh, dishes clean and purified. So, but make sure you're not washing them directly in the stream or yourself for that matter. Don't wash yourself in the stream. Don't take a bath in the waterfall um, where everybody's at um, and, you know, get soap all in there. That's not part of the natural environment, so you don't want to do that. Anything that you... And moving on, that was that was disposing of waste. Moving on to the next area, we're talking about leaving what you find. So, um, anything that you find, you're in a in some kind of a archaeological site, or you find an archaeological site, or archaeological or anthropological relics, you know, Native American structures, artifacts, any kind of cultural artifacts. Um, you want to leave those as you as you found them. Uh, recently, I was on a on a hike over here at Caddo Lake National Wildlife Refuge, and there's a Pioneer Cemetery over there. The Pioneer Cemetery is is fenced. It's got, uh, from what I can see, there's four graves in there. Uh, they all have headstones, but two of the headstones are missing. Like they're not they're not missing. Well, they're not missing, but they're off of the the base. They have broken off or fallen off over over time because they're you know, over a hundred year old 
headstones that probably are not maintained by anybody nowadays. But, uh, you know, I examined them. I photographed them. I made a video about the cemetery because it's a cool little pioneer cemetery of people used to live in the area. But I didn't, you know, take any souvenirs home with me or, you know, chip off a piece of the deal. Not that you would necessarily do that, but there are people that do that out there that take these things home with them. Um, any kind of rock, plant, natural objects that you find out there, leave them like leave them as you found them. And you want to avoid introducing or transporting non-native species. So you don't want to bring, you know, things that aren't native to the area into a natural area because you don't want to have an outbreak. A lot of these non-native things don't have competition. They don't have things that uh, keep them in check outside of their native native environment. And you don't want to build structures, furniture, dig trenches, nothing nothing like that. You don't want to you don't want to you don't want to change the environment from what you have already encountered. You want to leave it like it is. That way other people can experience it the same way that you experienced it. When you're doing your campfires, this is the next principle. It's about campfire impact. You want to you want to think about you know, what, you know, what is the absolute necessity for me to have this campfire? Do I absolutely need this campfire? And, you know, if in doubt, you know, if it's, if it's something that's, you know, questionable, you know, maybe you want to use a stove or some other cooking source. Uh, maybe you're going to use a candle lantern for light. Maybe you don't need to light light it like that. So just just think about that. Now, if you were going to if you were going to do a fire, you want to definitely do a do a fire in a established area, established fire ring. And make sure that you keep your fire small. You're only going to use dead or downed wood from the ground that can be broken by your hand. You're not going to be, you know, bringing in a big old axe and cutting stuff up. And make sure everything burns completely and everything is completely out before you leave the area. You want to respect wildlife, so you want to observe them from a distance. You don't want to feed them. You know, the animals that you may encounter, some of them could be dangerous, such as bears or uh, wolves, coyotes, you know, depending on where you're, where you're doing your, your hiking. Um, so, you know, you don't want to feed them. You don't want to entice them. Because you're going to alter their behavior. A lot of these animals in the bigger parks, like Yellowstone and um, other parks like that, they are company. They are used to being around, you know, the millions of visitors that come every every year, and so they've kind of gotten used to them. That they're still wild animals. They're not. They're not. Uh, they're not pets. They're not anything like that. And you don't want to uh, create them, create bad ideas for them to get into, bad habits, so to speak. And the other thing is you don't want to, you know, tempt them by having your, your, um, your food out for them to eat. So protect your food by storing that away and your trash as well. Um, your pets, you know, depending on the regulations of where you're going, you know, you might bring want to bring your dog, but it might not be the best idea to bring your dog. It's kind of have to get to think about that. You know, if, if you can't control the pet, you probably need to leave the pet at home. 
if they're not used to being out there without the, with the wildlife and wanting to chase the deer or chase the whatever, um, probably probably a good idea to keep those pets at home. Um, and you want to think about the times that wildlife are out there with their with their young or their mating or nesting or what other whatever, whatever other sensitive times there might be. So you want to definitely do that. And the last principle is being considerate of other visitors. So, you know, people go out to the outdoors to have a good experience. They want to have the best experience that they can, and they can't do that when somebody's got their Bluetooth speaker and they're blasting, you know, whatever music they're into um, out there in the middle of the forest or the park or wherever, you know. They, they don't want that. Just as an example, you know, other people that are coming on the trail, you know, typically people that are coming downhill, you know, you want to yield to those people. But, you know, always, you know, if you're a smaller group, you know, you want to yield to that bigger group. That's the way I do it. Um, when you have pack stock, such as horses or uh, mules, donkeys, whatever, that are coming down the trail that are pack animals, you know, you want to step on the downhill side of the trail and... You don't want to camp, obviously, on, on you know, right on top of somebody else's area. You want to give them plenty of space. Um, you want to talk in a normal voice, or if 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 necessary. I mean, you're in a you're in the outdoors, so you're trying to be, you know, I guess you know, a good word would be reverent. You're trying to be out there and enjoying your experience, and you're trying not to pull somebody else's experience. So you want to. You know, use your regular your regular voice. As we said back in school, you know, our inside voice. We want to use our inside voice, you know, when we're talking and not be yelling out in the middle of the night or yelling out and making weird noises and things like that. We don't want to try to disturb other people. But basically all of these principles, if you follow those, those will help you to be a better uh, outdoorsman and will protect the lands for future generations to to, to be on. And if you want more information about that, I'm going to do a handout on that that I'll have in my Etsy store very soon. And you can also go to the Leave No Trace Center for Outdoor Ethics. You can be That can be found at lnt.org on the World Wide Web. All right. All right. Well, for sake of time this week, y'all, this is kind of the holiday edition, like I said, for July the 4th, I'm going to wrap up the episode here. I think next time we'll jump a little more in depth into the 10 essentials and take those apart piece by piece and see how we can be better at the 10 essentials. So hopefully with the Leave No Trace principles, if you've never heard of those, I definitely recommend going to the website. Again, it's lnt.org. You can go to that website and learn a lot more about Leave No Trace. It's really a fascinating uh, study they did to come up with those principles. But overall, they have definitely helped in uh, reducing the human impact to a lot of the, the wildlands out there. So one thing I did not mention... On the last episode, I do have a Facebook group that you're welcome to join. It's the same name. It's called The Natural Medic Adventures. If you're looking for a community to kind of improve your skills, I'm kind of building that right now. It's in, in its infancy as far as, um, as far as that goes, but I'm trying to build that group right now. It's Again, it's The Natural Medic Adventures. It's on Facebook. I'll put a link in the show notes. When I get those up, um, I do have show notes up now on the episode two. Did find a way to get those up pretty pretty easily. Um, you can find me on the socials at on Instagram. I'm at the Natural Medic. Also on TikTok at the Natural Medic, and I'm on YouTube as the Natural Medic Adventures. I have a channel on there that I'm putting videos on, and I'm 
putting content out on Instagram and TikTok and also YouTube Shorts just about every day. There's, you know, a couple of videos a day usually and something to do with the outdoors, hiking, etc. I put that out pretty regularly. So, as before, the 50 off is still going to be applicable to um, any printable items related to this podcast and my other channels as well. Um, so you can just put that in at the checkout, 50 off, and you'll get half half price on those items. I should have a 10 Essentials. Probably will include a Leave No Trace principles as well in one little handout and then some other handouts as well that we've talked about in the previous podcast. Those are in progress as well and they'll be worked on and be completed soon. But definitely join me out there on the socials um, and um, look forward to seeing you there. Hope you have a really great 4th and a safe 4th. Enjoy your time with your friends and family members. Be safe and don't forget to get out there. But get out there safely, guys. Have a good one. See you next month.